the Civil War Digital Digest. I'm Andrew. Today we're continuing with our Arms and Uniforms series here, and we're going to be discussing one of the most famed regiments in the Civil War, the 2nd Wisconsin of the Iron Brigade. Now you've probably heard of the 2nd Wisconsin, and they're a famous regiment. They're the federal unit that lost the greatest percentage killed during the Civil War. You know, their service from 1861 to 64 covered the breadth of battles of the Army of the Potomac. But why we're here talking on today is not just because they're a famous unit, but the purpose of arms and uniforms is we look at the arms, equipment, and uniforms of a regiment, and we look at how it progressed during the war. We don't want to just look at one regiment and see it looks cool. We want to see how they changed over time, how their service changed, and how their service changed what they carried. And the 2nd Wisconsin should be a really interesting look at it. So the 2nd Wisconsin mustered into service in the summer of 1861. When President Lincoln called for 75,000 volunteers, they originally were going to muster in for a three-month regiment, but that was quickly changed to be a three-year regiment. The regiment was rushed, to the, rushed down to Washington, D.C. to help form the newly forming Army of Northeast Virginia under Irvin McDowell. And the uniform that you're seeing here is how they looked when they marched into their first combat at Bull Run on July the 21st, 1861. Let's address the obvious. The confusing part here is they're wearing gray and they're a U.S. regiment. And that's part of why Bull Run was such a confused fight for both sides. The state of Wisconsin was responsible for quickly equipping a unit for war and they went to go find the cheapest and most readily available cloths and materials available. And for Wisconsin at the time, that meant gray wool. And gray in the US is very much associated with military service. It's the color of the West Point cadets. It's often the color of militia units in, in the United States. Here you see that they are wearing a nine button frock coat made of a very similar style and construction to that that we're used to in the Civil War, but with black trim. They're also wearing gray trousers. Uh, some of the regiment's trousers had black seam welts, some did not. The one we're showing here doesn't have that seam welt. For headgear, the soldier is wearing a shako patterned on the British Army style used during the Crimean War. Now, there are no examples of this surviving today, so this is based on some evidence on the photographs, as well as looking at the militia scene in Wisconsin in the 1850s. The photos that we have that show this original Shaco shows that there was what was most likely called a back visor on it. Well, the style of hat that was in vogue in the 1850s that had that was the British Army style that was worn in the mid-1850s. Additionally, we know that the Wisconsin militia heavily favored British styles of dress, and that helps give further credence to why this was most likely patterned on the British style Shaco, which is why we had it reproduced here. As you can see, it also has a black tape on it and a chevron pattern on the front. Additionally, the soldiers are carrying a Model 1816 converted to percussion. So this would have originally been a 69 caliber flintlock musket produced between 1818 and 1840 at either Springfield Arsenal, Harpers Ferry, or by a private contractor. Now in the 1840s and 50s, a great many of these arms were converted to use in percussion. And these were the original weapons that the 2nd Wisconsin carried into combat. The leather that the soldiers carrying support this. These are pre-war style leathers, a 1839 cartridge box to support buck and ball ammunition or ball ammunition. It's a buff belt as well as a 1850 style shield pouch for the cap box. Additionally with the soldier, you see that he's using a state of Wisconsin style haversack as well as a state issued canteen. This canteen is more oval in shape and slightly rounded as different than the normal federal style smooth side canteen that was standard issue at the time. We chose not to show this soldier with a pack because we, can't, we don't have a good example of a reproduction pack and we didn't feel comfortable with the information we had reproducing one. However, what we know is that it was a militia style pack but with uh, webbing on it more similar to the 1855 style pack in federal service at the time. So this is the uniform that the 2nd Wisconsin went to war in, that they went into their first combat in, they started to make their reputation in. 
And it's also the uniform that they started to make a different reputation on. The 2nd Wisconsin and the Iron Brigade had a nickname, and they were the Raggedy Ass 2nd. And part of that is because literally these uniforms were in service so long that they fell apart on the soldiers. And um, by the end of their service, they were apparently uh, quite easy to see through. Next, we're gonna look at where they went to as the federal government started to resupply them in the fall of 1861. But in the meantime, here's one last look at how the second Wisconsin looked in their first combat at Bull Run with their original issue of state clothing and their first weapons as they went off to war. In 1862, the Iron Brigade got a new commander, John Gibbon, and he accelerated a process that was already going on. There's plenty of good evidence to show that by the winter of 1861-1862, the 2nd Wisconsin in particular had adopted a very regulation federal style uniform. As John Gibbon became the commander, he wanted to emphasize this look and he made it standard throughout the brigade. So that by the summer of 1862, the armed brigade was already becoming famous as the Black Hat Brigade. And that is the centerpiece of their identity. And you'll see it here, the model 1858 army dress hat, commonly called the Hardy hat, also called the scoosh hat. This is what they're wearing. And as you can see here, it's still fully dressed, all the brass, very regulation. This was the hat of the regular army on their dress occasions. And John Gibbon wanted the Iron Brigade to look formal. Additionally, you see here the frock coat, nine button frock coat, the dress uniform, it's trimmed with sky blue, the color of the infantry, as well as regulation model 1858 Trousers, these are not the sky blue trousers that were the emergency 1861 order, but the actual army issue. We know the army was still issuing great numbers of dark blue trousers in 1861 and 1862. As a matter of fact, we know they were still issuing them up to 1865. We know that the second Wisconsin was still wearing dark blue trousers at the time of Antietam by and large. As you move down to the feet, you see that the soldier is wearing Issue Brogans, 1851 Jefferson Booties, as well as gaiters. Commonly, these are considered Army of the Potomac style gaiters or leggings. They're there to protect the soldiers' ankles, prevent dirt and animals, vermin, from getting up between the pant legs and the socks. Now, when John Gibbon took over the brigade, he also instituted that soldiers would have white dress gloves, and the soldiers hated both of these. And there's a great story about someone from the Iron Brigade taking gaiters and putting them on John Gibbon's horse, who did not take that joke well at all. And I'm talking about Gibbon, not the horse. As you can see, the weapon is different. Now they're carrying the Model 1854 Lorenz from the Austrian Empire in 54 caliber. This is an incredibly good weapon. It's not as long as the Springfield or Enfield, but it is a rifle musket, as opposed to the smoothbore 1816s that they were carrying previously. They're now carrying a modern, state-of-the-art weapon capable of firing a Burton bullet for several hundred yards downrange. And that means that they can be more effective in combat at longer distances. The rest of the leather gear here is to facilitate that weapon. They're carrying a cartridge box for 54 caliber, as well as leathers to support that and the quadrangular bayonet of the Lorenz. Additionally, they're now using federal standard pack, an 1855 style pack, a smooth side canteen, and a uh, haversack. This is the uniform that the 2nd Wisconsin wore in their initial combat with the Iron Brigade, the part that really formed their identity and became part of their legend. This is what they wore at Bronner's Farm when the 2nd charged in headlong into the Stonewall Brigade. This is what they wore at South Mountain when the Iron Brigade earned its name. And this is what they wore when they went into the maelstrom of the cornfield at Antietam. The uniforms that they wore in 1862 when they made these campaigns made them famous, but they also were worn out by this part. After this point, the second Wisconsin started to wear a less distinctive uniform. And that's what we'll see as we go forward in our next segment. Here you now see how the second Wisconsin looked as they went into perhaps their most famous battle, the Battle of Gettysburg. By the summer of 1863, the 2nd Wisconsin was worn down. They only had a couple hundred men left in them. And as you can see, they started to look more and more like the average soldiers of the war. 
They obviously are still keeping their distinctive black hats, that hardy hat that helped win them their early name that's part of their identity. But you can see that the hat's a little different too. There's less ornamentation on it. And there's a new addition that makes a big difference, the core badge. You see the red circle here indicates the first division of the first core. This was part of an army-wide program in order to help commanders easily identify the troops under them. In private soldiers had to sew these core badges onto their hat or their blouse, but these core badges became a symbol of pride throughout the army. They were on wagons, on artillery pieces. They were on the flags that told that differentiated brigades and divisions, and they became part of the soldier's identity after the war. Also, you see that the coat is different. Instead of the frock coat, the formal dress coat of the army, now he's wearing a sack coat. We know looking at quartermaster returns that as 1863 started, less and less frock coats were being worn by the Iron Brigade. The sack coat was more ubiquitous, it was cheaper for the soldiers to buy, and it was just more available in the supply system of the army. Also, you can see that he's now wearing light blue trousers. The army authorized light blue trousers for all soldiers starting in December of 1861, even though we know it was in use before that point. And the supply system had always had both in it up to that point, with more and more light blue trousers coming out every year. By 1863, we know the Second Wisconsin has joined the vast majority of federal soldiers wearing light blue trousers. The rest of his gear hasn't really changed very much, though. It's still the same leather supporting the same weapon system. He's still wearing a pack. He's still wearing a federal issue blanket, a shelter half. But this is going to be the last hurrah for his Austrian Lorenz. This is the last battle the Second Wisconsin carries it in. And one of the important things to note in this is it's a different caliber than every other regiment in the First Corps. As a matter of fact, during the Battle of Gettysburg, the First Corps' First Division Ordnance Train delivered 75,000 rounds under fire to the men of the First Corps, which is the only reason they stayed in the fight. Think about how confusing it was for that ordnance team to make sure that the 54 caliber rounds got to one particular regiment in the middle of the maelstrom of July 1st, 1863. After this point, the 2nd Wisconsin was never the same, but soldiers from the regiment stayed in service through the end of the war. As they became veterans, their look changed once more, and we're gonna check that out next. <laughs> And finally, here we see a soldier from the 2nd Wisconsin, as he would have looked in their last couple weeks of service in the summer of 1864 outside Petersburg, Virginia. The appearance of the soldier has continued to change and evolve. The black hat is still there, that symbol of pride, again, with very little ornamentation, still spouting the 1st Corps badge, even though by this point the men were in the 4th Division of the 5th Corps, which meant that they should have been wearing a green Maltese cross, However, army regs allowed the soldiers to keep their old corps badges and the men of the Iron Brigade proudly wore theirs through the rest of the war. The jacket he's wearing is a roundabout style jacket common with veterans who had re-enlisted for the war. It's a nine button front made of a six piece construction. However, it has non-functional cuffs and this particular one sports a veteran service stripe, a half chevron on the lower sleeve of blue cloth with red edging. This chevron indicates that he had done one enlistment of war service and that he had re-enlisted. So this soldier would be one of the second Wisconsin soldiers who re-enlisted for the duration of the war. His weapon has changed and that's an important part. Previously they had carried a 54 caliber Lorenz. Now he's carrying a different imported weapon the Pattern 1853 Enfield Rifle Musket in 577 caliber, capable of using the normal Federal 58 caliber ammunition. No longer would the 2nd Wisconsin have to be that unit in the Corps that had different ammunition. They had a weapon that was noted for its reliability and its robustness. While they never complained about their Lorenzes, the Enfield was loved universally by troops. The rest of the leathers have been updated to show later war. We know that leathers during the Civil War didn't last long, several months to maybe a half a year, and the leathers you're seeing here are indicative of 1863-1864 service. We're showing a later war cartridge box, the waist belt has a brass keeper on it, 
The Banette Scabbard is a seven rivet model. These are the kind of leathers that would have been in the supply system towards the end of the second Wisconsin service. The second Wisconsin ended its war looking vastly different than it entered the war. And it reflected hard service through some of the most difficult battles in the Eastern theater of the Civil War. These soldiers served in the famed Iron Brigade. And that's a name that was not born lightly because they suffered for it. They went through battle after battle losing men, but they maintained a distinctive style of dress through most of their service. Whether the gray uniform that they went to war in or the army regulation war that they became famous in, they earned a reputation for their looks as well as their acumen under fire. The second Wisconsin changed its weapons three times during the war, trading a smooth bore musket converted from flint to percussion for a serviceable weapon of an odd caliber, finally to one of the two standard federal arms of the war. And that's what they finished their service with. Now, for many soldiers in the second Wisconsin and for the soldier we pictured here, their service didn't end when the second Wisconsin mustered out. The veterans continued on as the independent Wisconsin battalion, serving through the summer of 1864, before they were finally combined with the 6th Wisconsin. At the end of the war, those two companies of veterans of the 2nd Wisconsin still served with the 6th Wisconsin at Appomattox and at the Grand Review in Washington. I hope you've enjoyed this journey through the history of the uniforms and equipment of the 2nd Wisconsin. I think it's important to see how they went from wearing gray uniforms to this distinctive uniform to a more serviceable uniform by the end and how their weapons went from smoothbore muskets to an imported weapon of an odd caliber to finally one of the standard weapons of the war. It's these kind of regiments that we wanna look at here at Arms and Uniforms on Civil War Digital Digest. I hope you've learned something today and I hope you'll come back and join us next time. I'm Andrew and we'll see you later.